Welcome to our third uh, review lecture for AP US history. Today, looking at period three, 1877 to 1945. I like to, to, to see this as kind of the, the rise of America as a world empire. Uh, exploring unit six and seven today, or chapter 16 to 25 in AMSCO AP US history. So this is a, a, a beast of a unit. It covers quite a few topics. Um, you can see from my review uh, notes, period one and period two, we've already got those filled out. Watch the first two review lectures for that. And then period three, focusing on, on this, this huge period of, of change for the US with the Gilded Age, American imperialism, and then the World Wars and the New Deal. So a lot to cover. Let's see if we can do this in 20 minutes. Uh, starting with the Gilded Age. Uh, the Gilded Age is the time period in the late 1800s, perhaps up until 1914, um, that sees the rise of industrialization in America. Um, so the Gilded Age, again, late 1800s, uh, up until maybe er early 1900s, um, that sees uh, the rise of industrialization in America, especially in the North, the North and the Midwest, I would say. Um, and you might remember that we had this, this question of whether or not the leaders of the Gilded Age, whether or not they were captains of industry or robber barons. Um, so it's always a good idea to have one or two examples kind of ready um, for that. Maybe Rockefeller um, or Carnegie. Um, uh, you could do Vanderbilt or Morgan as well captains of industry because they created these massive oil and steel and railroad industries. Um, and they led to a lot of economic growth, a lot of industrial growth as well, but also robber barons because these uh, Gilded Age industrial leaders, they bought out the competition or they crushed the competition. They oftentimes suppressed uh, uh, workers trying to fight for more rights. But then again, the captains of industry side, well, many of these people donated hundreds of millions of dollars to universities, to museums and things like that. So always this, this interesting uh, debate around whether or not these uh, leaders of the Gilded Age were captains of industry or robber barons. Regardless of what side you settle on, um, there, uh, the, the Gilded Age drastically changes what it's like to live in America. Um, so there's huge urban growth, um, there's also increased immigration, which we'll see in a moment. Um, and all of this creates new challenges. Um, I'll get to that on the next slide. So why don't we move on? Um, this slide shows changing America. This slide shows um, late 1800s to early 1900s, let's call it 1880 to 1914 or so, um, the ch uh, uh, changing uh, uh, demographics of immigrants coming to the US. Uh, most of the immigrants had been what were called old immigrants. They came from Northern and Western Europe, um, especially England and Germany. Um, but you can see now we begin to see new immigrants from Europe coming from Southern and Eastern Europe, Italy, Greece, etc. We see some immigrants coming from our neighbors to the North and South, Canada and, and, and Latin America. And then we see a decent chunk of immigrants coming from Asia, uh, especially Chinese and Japanese um, coming to Angel Island, San Francisco, especially during the gold rush. Um, so we do see increased immigration um, from, new, um, from new places. Uh, we see uh, new immigrants uh, from uh, Southern and Eastern Europe, and they go to the North and the Midwest. And then we see um, Asian immigrants, especially from China, to the West Coast, especially um, during the gold rush and during the construction of railroads. Um, now, what we see kind of, of, of patterns of both of these is that immigrants um, often settled in ethnic neighborhoods. They settled in neighborhoods kind of of alike people. We uh, especially see that in, in New York City, um, where, where huge political machines would be built um, to, to help the people, to, to uh, uh, take care of the people's needs, both uh, people that had been there for a while and new immigrants. Um, and then these political machines would also become you know, political bosses to get all of the power. Um, so we see some, some benefits. We see like political machines that were built to gain power, but also to help um, the members of the community. But we also see discriminatory laws. 
discriminatory immigration laws. Um, the Chinese Exclusion Act of the 1800s is the most infamous example of that. So changing America as people grapple with what that means for their neighborhoods, I suppose. Um, the next big change that we see, again, 1880 to 1914, is the progressive era. Um, this kind of uh, a banner up here shows um, increased journalism that focused on how the other half lives, kind of political exposés or muckraking that exposed how um, poorer people lived. And so that led to movements, uh, uh, the woman suffrage movement, uh, the movement to make workplaces safer, especially for children, the American temperance movement to uh, prohibition to ban alcohol. Um, and so the, the progressive era, again, 1880 to 1914, this was an era of social and political uh, reform. And so some examples of that um, for political, we see um, votes for women. We also see uh, trust busting, breaking up monopolies. For social reforms, we see prohibition, which is banning alcohol. Um, and we also see, I guess that's actually an economic reform. We see um, improved uh, working conditions and child labor laws. Um, many of these progressive era reformers were often women. Um, and so women kind of were able to uh, gain this new role in society of being reformers, um, fighting for the vote certainly, but also leading the charge for prohibition. This was connected to a, a second great awakening, another religious revival uh, during this time period. But this time period, 1880 to 1914, so after reconstruction before World War I, there's so much going on. Uh, uh, the Gilded Age is industrializing America. Uh, immigration is changing demographics. There's this, this push for uh, reforms to make society more um, humane, I guess. Um, but we also, politically, we see um, the rise of the American empire with American imperialism. Um, and so you can see uh, where most of the American colonies were. You can see that they had a handful of them in the 1850s, but most of them, 1898, Philippines, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Cuba was a little bit complicated, but that could have been 1898 there as well. Um, and so the Spanish-American War, 1898, um, oftentimes is seen as like uh, marks the beginning of uh, America as a world empire. With the Spanish-American um, uh, War, they gain Puerto Rico, they gain the Philippines, they gain Guam. Um, Cuba, again, a little bit complicated because um, we, uh, I'm not spelling the Philippines right, an extra I in there maybe. Why is it not saying I spell it right? Okay, whatever. Um, and so as America uh, uh, becomes a world empire, I would think I'm typing in Spanish. Okay, as America rises to a world empire, the idea is uh, kind of continuing the Monroe Doctrine, which is that the Western hemisphere, if you will, uh, belongs to the US. Um, This is going to um, allow the US to become a world power, but it's also gonna create some conflict, especially with Japan when we get closer to World War II. Now, before World War II is the first world war, you might remember that the US was initially neutral. Um, that was for a variety of reasons. Um, first, there were immigrants from, from both sides of the war in America, which made it kind of complicated in terms of what side the US would join. Um, and then the U.S. Was, joined, was enjoying all of this economic growth during the Gilded Age. Um, we were eventually uh, forced into the war um, because of two main reasons. Um, so we, we joined to support um, the Allies in 1917. Um, two main reasons. One was to protect trade to Western Europe. Um, we were worried that, that trade would be disrupted. Um, but also um, because of Germany's poly po policy of unrestricted submarine warfare, which sank a, a, a several American merchant ships, we were losing lives and losing wealth. And then there were some, some German acts of aggression against the US. 
the Lusitania was a, a uh, merchant ship. Um, it was a British ship f sailing fr from New York to uh, England. Killed, uh, it was sunk by a German submarine, killed 1,200 people, 128 Americans. Um, and so this was the first blow, 1915. But the Zimmerman telegram, 1917, is what really forces the US to join, um, where Germany sends a telegram to Mexico, tries to get Mexico to attack the US. So we know that we have to join. Um, we only fight for a, a year or so, but the effects on the home front are significant in that we see an increased role of the government kind of in controlling the economy. And we see women um, working in factory jobs, which is eventually going to get them to vote right after the war is over. And so initially, um, the, the uh, post-war period, 1919 through up to 1929, is the roaring 20s, you know, um, you've got uh, economic prosperity, at least for the wealthy. Um, you've got the Harlem Renaissance, which is this, this explosion of kind of um, a uniquely black culture, people like Langston Hughes um, breaking out onto the scene. Um, but 1929 is when we see the Great Depression. Um, so October of 19, 1929 is when it all starts um, to go downhill. Um, there were a lot of causes of the Great Depression, but the biggest cause is that um, a lot of the, the uh, economic growth of the US had been paid for on credit. Um, so lots of people um, buying things on credit, which means buying things with money they don't actually have. As the economy starts to restrict, people take their money out and then there's a panic. Um, there is a rush on banks for everyone to pull their money out and then it exacerbates and the economy uh, collapses. Um, and so this leads to massive inflation, unemployment, uh, uh, massive poverty. I want to say unemployment was around 30 or 40%. Um, as if that weren't bad enough, the Dust Bowl uh, forces huge people um, to uh, leave uh, the South, Oklahoma, Arkansas, for example, and many of them oftentimes move west to California, which leads to lots of, of tough encounters um, where the Californians didn't want these migrants coming to them. Um, the Great Depression, one of the you know, most challenging economic periods of our life, but it, it's followed by the New Deal, which is one of the most triumphant periods of, of American history. And the New Deal really, um, it, it creates the modern democratic party. It, 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 it sh uh, drastically expands what the federal government can do. And so this is a map of uh, just a selection of some of the New Deal programs. You can see they are constructing things all over the US. Um, they're constructing highways in uh, Southern California. It looks like they're, they're constructing a dam here maybe. They're constructing railroads. They are uh, working on, on agricultural fields. They're building tunnels. They're building buildings. Um, oil fields, all of this massive construct, construction. And so FDR uses the New Deal, early 1930s, to uh, stimulate the economy and put people back to work. Um, oftentimes, his programs are kind of captured as relief, recovery, and reform. And so relief is all about putting people back to work. Um, and so all of the, that, that whole alphabet soup, uh, the Works Prog Pro Progress Administration, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Tennessee Valley Authority, all of this is putting people back to work. Recovery is, most, is, is kind of about um, getting businesses back. So there was a bank holiday that kind of put a freeze on uh, uh, the opening of banks so that they could stabilize. Um, they offered, uh, he offered loans to businesses to get them back on their feet. And then there is reform, which is all about trying to prevent a future crisis or a future abuse of power from businesses. So like the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which was all about monitoring businesses to make sure that they're not abusing their power and some other ones as well. Um, FDIC, which, which uh, uh, promises, which guarantees that banks will have money in the bank. So, you should know some specific uh, New Deal programs, just you know, memorize a handful of them, three or four of them. But you should also know that the New Deal um, drastically 
uh, increases the role of the federal government in people's lives because now the federal government is actively in charge of creating jobs. Uh, this is an idea of deficit spending. It's also sometimes called Keynesian economics. The idea that, that, that the federal government should spend money they don't have, build up a temporary deficit in order to stimulate the economy and it works. And then I should also add that this kind of marks like the, the birth of, of the modern uh, Democratic Party all the way through today with Joe Biden, um, where the modern Democratic Party believes that kind of a big federal government should um, take care of its people and should, should spend money to uh, create programs to help the people. I can add um, Social Security as another um, New Deal program up here. The New, Deal, uh, the New Deal allows us to get back on our feet, but the US doesn't fully get out of the Great Depression until World War II. Um, and so World War II, um, a few things of note for World War II. Um, first, the US was um, officially neutral um, at first, but they clearly supported the allies. You might remember um, the Cash, Car uh, Cash and Carry Act or the Lend-Lease Act, which uh, essentially said um, that we would provide um, weapons and supplies and, and, and things like that to the allies as long as they carried it on their own ships um, or, or something like that. So even before the U.S. officially joined the allies, um, which we will after Pearl Harbor, December 8, 1941 is when we, we declare war, we were clearly on the side of the allies. Um, in terms of talking about the war, um, I mean, the US is, is crucial um, in the allied victory. You've got D-Day in Europe, you've got the nuclear bomb in Japan, um, which ultimately ends the war in Japan. Um, but you also see kind of um, huge changes on the home front. Um, so some things that we see is we see the federal government gains huge control over the economy uh, during war. Uh, they, they tell businesses what to make and um, they kind of coordinate the economy. It's almost like a planned economy like totalitarian states oftentimes have. Um, now that is generally speaking a temporary um, um, change. The federal government gives up a lot of that economic control after the war, but still significant. Um, and then we also see the incarceration of Japanese American citizens. Remember we explored that, that DBQ in class that explored whether this was a question of national security or racial prejudice. Perhaps it was a little bit of both. You could easily argue both ways, um, but executive order 9066 by FDR um, forcibly re relocated hundreds of thousands of Japanese Americans, uh, many of them, most of them citizens. Um, which created quite um, a bit of um, a stain on the American historical record. Um, by the time the war ends, um, World War II, or sorry, the U.S. kind of um, emerges from World War II as a world superpower and fully recovered from the Great Depression. And so as we're wrapping up this lecture here, again, this was a big one. Uh, uh, oh, whoops, hold on. 1877 to 1945, we've got um, this, th th this post-Civil War, pre-World War I, 1880 to 1914 time period that drastically changes the makeup, make out, uh, whatever, the uh, makeup of America with the Gilded Age, increased immigration, the Progressive Era, and then American imperialism, all of this allowing America to grow, to become stronger, to industrialize, to become a world power, but also changing what the demographics of America looks like. Pause here. And then the uh, World War I and World War II, um, the US joins both of them reluctantly, um, but ultimately this allows the US to continue to rise as a world power. And then the effects of the Great Depression and the New Deal. And uh, some of the, uh, programs that FDR created that really lay the uh, foundation for um, future um, programs that the US will, will, will do for the next hundred years. So pause here. And then a little bit we lost on the last page. <laughs>